title of the message tonight is Beautiful Feet. Beautiful Feet, which if you think about it, it's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> I mean, we all know feet are nasty, <laughs> right? The bunions and the, uh, you know, the, the toe jam. <laughs> I mean, the, they could be kind of nasty. Planter's warts. How many people get planter's warts? Be honest. I get them, man. And they do, it takes forever to go away. Somebody, who was telling me, who was telling me how to get rid of them? Somebody just recently was telling me how to get rid of planter's warts. Anyway, they were talking about, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, rice vinegar, I think it was. You take rice vinegar and you just keep a Q-tip like a, uh, uh, soaked in it and you like keep I know who it was now but anyway and you keep on like uh, on the wart you just keep it taped up on there or whatever for a long period of time and it burns and it burns and it burns and eventually that whole thing just like falls out is what he was saying I'm gonna have to try that sometime <laughs> but I get those from time to time which is why if you go camping or whatever like where there's a shower that other people use or you go to a hotel or something like that wear shower shoes <laughs> right because you're gonna pick up all kind of bacteria stuff like that but feet are nasty. Look at Solomon 7.1 real quick. This is hilarious. Song of Solomon. Did I just say Solomon? Song of Solomon. I don't preach from the Song of Solomon a whole lot, okay? <laughs> There's good stuff. It's, it's biblical. It's Bible. It's an inspired word of God, but I don't preach from there a whole lot, but I love this. Song of Solomon 7.1, he says, How beautiful are thy feet with shoes. <laughs> Keep your shoes on. But other than that, beautiful feet. <laughs> About the only feet that I can think of that are like I just look at and they're, I, I, it's I, like babies. You know, a lot of babies going around with no shoes on. Like they got cute feet. They're cute. They're perfect. You know, they haven't been uh, put mile, thousands of miles on them yet. You know, I think my feet, my wife. OK, if you if you think your wife's feet are cute, that's OK. You can think that. But I'm just going to be honest. I love my wife. I think her feet are cute, but sometimes they're nasty. <laughs> OK, because feet are nasty in our culture, though, you can kind of mask it. You can put the socks on. You can keep the shoes on. You know, uh, people get baths pretty much every day. I think it's typical, you know, among us baths or showers every day. Hopefully you wash your feet when you get a shower. And, uh, you know, there are some exceptions of people who just always have nasty feet, but we just they just keep their shoes on and then they're okay. <laughs> and nowadays you could go in someone's house and, you know, I grew up uh, a good portion of my life in Japan. And in Japan, it was a culture. Now we lived on military base. Not everybody picked this up, but my family, my mom said, hey, I like this rule. Culturally, what you do when you enter their house, you take your shoes off at the door. And a lot of times they'll even have slip their, their house slippers, house shoes, and they'll take their shoes off and they'll, they'll have their little cubby with their house shoes and they'll put those on and they'll, uh, and they'll walk around. But nowadays in America, if you do that, most people look at you like you're weird. Like, why did you just take your shoes off? That's weird. So you go in there. A lot of times you even keep your shoes on in people's house houses. But in this, I don't know if they took the shoes off or what, but in the, in the culture of the Bible times, it wasn't quite like that. It was customary, in fact, to wash your feet regularly, even though they didn't have the access like we do. If you ever really think about how spoiled we are as Americans, just, you know, we can take like hour long showers or baths, you know, and it's the right temperature and we don't have to worry about that. That's, that's a, quite a luxury that we have. Uh, even when we wash our dishes and we just keep the water going and all, well, we got dishwashers. I mean, you know, that's even uh, more of a luxury, but, uh, but when it comes to the feet in that culture, you know, you didn't have to take a bath every day or take a shower every day necessarily, but they would definitely wash their hands before they eat. Now, unfortunately they'd pass a little basin around, they'd wash their hands in the basin. That's pretty gross. And they would wash their feet. Okay. Let's look at a few verses just to show what I'm talking about. As If you've read your Bible through, read it for very long, you've already seen a lot of these, no doubt. But Genesis 18 is the first place we'll go. Genesis 18, just a few examples. And verse 4, Genesis 18, verse 4. <clears throat> Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Uh, and so then that's we won't get into all this, the story storyline there. But the guests, when guests come, they said, hey, have a little water and wash your feet. Look at chapter 19. 
In 18, these, these men came to uh, uh, Abraham, and in 19, they're going to come to Lot. And in verse 2, it says, And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and, uh, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your way. And they said, Nay. So it was almost like, as, as often as they come to your house, it was culturally acceptable that you would say, Hey, could I get you a water? Right? So how many soul winning, like you've had people on a regular basis, it seems like, well, not maybe all that terribly often, but every once in a while they'll say, hey, could I get you a glass of water or, or a bottle of water? And I try to, t today I actually said, no, that's right, I'm okay. And then I said, Braden, you want one? And he was like, sure, because he was really thirsty. And so she came out with a water and a Gatorade, Powerade. I'm pretty sure that lady was saved and she's going to heaven. <laughs> And if she is, she's got rewards in heaven for it, right? But uh, uh, so you, uh, you know, but sometimes you go, it's hosp hospitality. You go and they offer you uh, some water or something. Uh, you know, they offer you a meal. And the, in these days, you see, they'd come in, hey, why don't you stay a while? My wife will put some soup on and some bread. And, and, uh, and, and that was the custom. But also they would say, hey, why don't you wash your feet? <laughs> that would be kind of weird today. Someone come in your house, hey, let me get some water. You can wash your feet. All right, but that's uh, culturally what they did. Look at chapter 24. Genesis 24, starting verse 29. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man, unto the well. And it came to pass when he saw the, the earrings and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah's sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, and he came unto me, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for thy camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the, uh, and the men's feet that were with him. Uh, and there was set before, meat before him and, and on and on. So you see, this is just part of their custom that you'd come in and wash your feet, you know, and, and usually it was like, hey, let me give you some water so you can wash your feet, <laughs> right? But if you had a servant, a lot of times the lowly job of the servant was to wash somebody else's feet. Like, hey, wash this man's feet. It was a really lowly job. It was kind of like not really the acceptable thing, you know, that somebody would do, but it was a uh, it was one of those jobs, you know, somebody's got to do it. And so they would wash their feet. And so this is a very lowly job. Look at First Samuel. We've talked about Abigail before and how she was a servant and uh, how her husband was uh, probably reprobate. Uh, this is the indication that I get. And uh, she ends up like leaving him because it's a war situation and she's got to decide, am, am I and my family going to survive this thing or are we going to stay close to him and David's going to come and kill us in the power of the Lord? So she turns to David and to the, and to the God of David and uh, shows herself to be a servant. Now, I don't believe that David should have married her because he is adding to himself wives, which the Bible said for kings not to do. Uh, but 1 Samuel 25 is what we're looking for. 1 Samuel 25. Um, starting in verse 39. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of, of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face on the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So she's, you know, accepting this grace that she would go and she would live with the king's house. And she's like, I'll be a servant and I'll wash the feet of my Lord. And what she was doing is showing a very lowly and humble position as a servant. And so this is why, obviously, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but this is why the washing, Jesus washing the disciples' feet was such a shocking thing because it was a very lowly thing for a servant to do. In fact, let's just go there. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, what did I do here? Actually, I think it's verse, tw it's chapter 12, isn't it? Yep, chapter 12. This isn't where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I got mixed up, okay? But this is another story of uh, the lady, Mary, who washes Jesus' feet with her hair, okay? Look at uh, how this goes. And Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, uh, why was this ointment sold uh, for three? Why wasn't this? Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear that was uh, put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying, hath she kept this? For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and he came not. Uh, for, they came not for Jesus' sake only. Uh, and anyway, it goes on. Now, if you compare this with other uh, accounts, there's one where it talks about she poured the ointment on his head, and I believe that's the same Mary. I think she did his head and she did his feet. And then we, when you see her at their feet, she's wiping it with her hair, and she's just she's just at Jesus's feet. You know, and Mary, Mary got this right. You know, she was, uh, we're going to talk about that more in a second, but she was very humble. She was a servant, but she was at Jesus's feet. And the thing is, I don't have time to develop this. This would be a good sermon uh, uh, material for another time. But Jesus said about Mary, you know, everywhere the gospels preached, you know, this story is going to be told about Mary. And, you know, and it's, it's really interesting that it's, it's shared, you know, in that, in that manner. And yet, you know, there's only one gospel account of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But all the gospel accounts talk about this story about Mary uh, uh, doing this, you know, this, this act because it was very lowly of her. It was very, uh, uh, you know, sign of a servant. And, and it really meant a lot to Jesus that she did this. All right. So... In this message, what I want to talk about is the idea of beautiful feet. And the Bible uses that phrase, it talks about beautiful feet. And, uh, and I just want to think about this for a minute. The first point is, I've already mentioned Mary and how she's at Jesus' feet. And uh, think about the beautiful feet of Jesus. And I don't mean physically. I'm assuming Jesus' feet, you know, I don't mean any disrespect, but I'm sure they are just kind of nasty looking like anyone else's feet are, <laughs> right? And uh, I don't think there was anything beautiful, particularly about his feet. Uh, but the Bible has, says a lot about that. And we, you know, Jesus is precious to us. Uh, we think about that. I can't imagine. Uh, I think one day we'll get that opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet. I know we will. And, uh, and really show the respect and all that we deserve. And, and we will love that opportunity to worship him in that way. But look at uh, our text that was read in Isaiah 53, or actually Isaiah 52. Starting in verse 14, it, it, this is prophetic, of course. Uh, you know, this is Isaiah. This is many years before Jesus came, but this is prophetic. It says, And uh, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any visage, uh, more, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that uh, which hath not been told, uh, them shall they see. And I'm sorry if I'm missing words. This is my small print. And they which, uh, uh, in, in that which they have not heard, shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is, despi is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid as it, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace uh, was upon him. 
and with his stripes we are healed. What a beautiful passage of scripture that is as we think about way before he even came just this prophecy that Jesus would come and he'd give of himself he'd be uh, you know pierced and he would be uh, you know bruised and wounded and all these things for us and you know I think about this just the in th in this I'm getting into the next point here but just the fact that he used those feet to go spread you know, the word, the good news, the gospel, and he walked around. And you ever think about how much, how many miles Jesus must have put on his feet? Uh, I was reading, there was a guy that actually tried to figure this out. This guy's got like the Guinness Book of, of, of World Records, like on, on walking, and he's actually walked since like the 60s. I don't know how many, I don't know how old he is now, but he's, he's tried to put that, he's got the record of the most miles that he's put on his feet, basically. And he's, he's just walked all the time. And I don't remember, I remember how much, how many miles it is. Uh, but he tried to estimate, he's like, he couldn't find in the Bible, he's also a believer, and he couldn't find in the Bible, uh, or I mean, any material where somebody had done the work. So he went through and tried to follow the life, everything that's recorded in the Bible of, of where Jesus went and, and, you know, taking in consideration that they would go three times to the temple, uh, you know, every year, and then uh, just the different uh, routes that he took in his ministry, you know. But think about this, Jesus' ministry was only three years. So then he had to figure out, everything that he did before that. And then his whole life, you know, Jesus died about 33. And so, you know, it was relatively short, the amount of miles that he said that Jesus probably put on his feet. Uh, it was like 25,000 or something like that, which is approximately the distance around the world uh, uh, on the equator. And, uh, and so he thought that was a neat thing. But I'm going to tell you this, it was way more than that. All right. Because how many people have a step counter, you know, and you like go around on a regular basis, like at work. And then at the end of the day, you look at your step counter and you're like, wow, I put that many miles on my feet. Who has one of those? What do you do on an average on a, on a day? Some it's going to be a lot more than others. I realize that. But on an average day, just walking into your store, wherever you work, well, how many miles do you think you put on your feet? What about you? Estimate. <laughs> 11, you said? Good grief. <laughs> so back and forth in the warehouse and all that stuff. So what I read is that it's very common. Five miles is actually pretty common. Like you don't even realize you put that much in a day on your feet. Okay, so I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus put a whole lot more than that. Plus, the Bible says in John, at the, at the end of John, hey, if all the things Jesus did were written, the, uh, the world couldn't contain all the books that would be written about all that he did. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't even know that's in the Bible that he did. So Jesus put a lot of miles on his feet. As I said, feet probably weren't that pretty, right? Even Isaiah in our text right here, it just talks about his whole appearance, I don't think was very attractive as a human being. It wasn't just like, you know... I've heard people say, like, he wasn't that beautiful figure that you see in the paintings. I think the guy in the paintings is pretty ugly <laughs> with the long hair and all that stuff. So, you know, forget about that. But I don't think he was any kind of a beautiful, attractive man in that way. And that was for a reason, you know. But, uh, but anyway, the, all that he went through, the wear and tear that he put on his body, and then obviously being beaten and all that stuff for us, what a beautiful thing. But do you know also, uh, we know this, that his feet were pierced. Now, it's interesting, if you look for the verse in the Bible that says nails were driven through his feet, you won't find it. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain on that. You won't find any place that says nails were put through Jesus' feet. In fact, I read something that said, uh, it's a myth. People say that his feet were nailed and all that, but really that's nowhere in the Bible, and it was probably like he was tied up. I don't know if you've ever seen like a, a picture of Jesus and he's, and he's tied up, and you're like, wait, where's the nails? All right? So some people try to say, oh, that's all it was. They didn't actually nail them. But wait a minute, the Bible actually gives us some indications about this, some pretty clear indications, right? Let's look at them real quickly. Uh, Psalm 22, you say, Psalm, yeah, but that's not, you know, that's not the gospel account. Yeah, but this is prophetic. Psalm 22, verse 16. I realize this is an exciting preaching not an exciting preaching type message, but uh, uh, this is an interesting little study here. Proverbs, I mean, not Proverbs, Psalm 22. Did I say Proverbs? All right, Psalm 22, and uh, look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. 
All right, and if you read this story, another prophecy, go to Luke chapter 26. Luke chapter 26. I don't know why I said 26, 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. This is Jesus when he's revealing himself to the disciples here. And he says, behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as uh, ye see me have. Now, I realize it doesn't necessarily say that, look at the holes in my feet. You know, like Thomas said, hey, if I put my hand, my fingers in the holes of his hand, the prints of his hands, I don't remember how he says it, or, the, or into his side. And so we understand that those were physical things that he still had. But, uh, but I believe it's pretty clear. And it said that in Psalm, Psalms that they pierced his hands and his feet. And then here he's saying, look at my hands and my feet, that there are probably their imprints in his feet as well. And I don't know that I, I can't say this for sure, but, uh, but the, my, I, my understanding is that his feet were crossed like that and it was nailed in between two. I don't know. I, I, I don't think the Bible ever explains that exactly. But my point that I'm trying to make is his feet were part of that uh, part of his body that was marred and pierced and that suffered, right, for us. And, uh, I mean, I don't know, have you ever had a thorn in your foot? Uh, just the pain and the agony that happened, that imagine a nail being driven through uh, your feet. But here's the thing, look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I believe Jesus now has beautiful feet, okay, in more than one way. Revelation 1 verse 14. This is a description of Jesus. We'll start in verse uh, uh, 12, actually. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, uh, clothed with a garment down uh, to the foot, and gird about the paps with the go golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as, the, as white as the snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he had seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shineth uh, in his strength. Now, I talked about this in our series on Revelation when we went through this, and I believe this is a, a genuine image of what, what John was seeing, because he could read that and be like, well, I think it's just symbolic. I don't think he really looked like that. But it's very con consistent. All throughout the Bible, when people saw a revelation of angels, seraphim, cherubim, you know, or Jesus himself, they saw similar images, right? This brightness and the fire and all these kind of things. And then it always says that their feet were like brass. I don't know why, but his feet were like brass, okay? And so whatever that would symbolize, I don't know, but I believe that's really what is seen on them, okay? So Jesus, the Bible shows us, uh, a lot about his feet, and I'm going to just, you know, take from that, that the beautiful feet of Jesus. But if nothing else, the beauty of his feet was that, like I said earlier, he took the his word, he took the gospel, the good news into uh, the world. Look back at Isaiah again. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth uh, good, uh, good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 10. In this passage here, uh, in Isaiah, what we're talking about, and we won't go there now for the sake of time, but Nahum chapter 1, verse 15, if you want to write that down, look at it sometime, whatever. Nahum chapter 1, verse 15 is almost a, the same kind of quote. And what this was probably thought of from those prophets and anyone who read it during those days is that the children of Israel are going to be delivered from captivity. 
All right. And God was going to show himself. Uh, and he was going to restore them and he was going to deliver them. And here are these people that have been in captivity. They've been prisoners of war. They've been, you know, a lot of people of, of their people have been slain. And now somebody's going to come and tell them, hey, King Cyrus, or, you know, if it was Babylonian, King Cyrus said, we're going back into the land. And everybody's jo joyful and shouting and everything. And, and uh, the messenger, you know, the, delivers th that message, you know, was it, his feet are beautiful, symbolically, not physically. <laughs> okay, probably some nasty feet. Symbolically, beautiful feet. All right. Have you ever, uh, you know, you've this thought about like just, have you ever seen, uh, you heard the phrase, uh, the expression, you know, uh, uh, kill the messenger? Right. That would be if a messenger delivers bad news, you want to kill the messenger. But the opposite, whenever they bring good news, it's like you want to hug them. And you'll see that sometimes, uh, you know, show, you know, where they, they bring good news and you're just so excited. You just hug the person that brought the message and they don't have anything to do about it. They're just delivering the message. Now, you probably know everybody in here probably understands the Bible talks a lot about these guys. Um, I like running, but I think that this would be a terrible job. And that is delivering the message. All right. Delivering the message. You're in you're in war and the king's like, hey, we need some reinforcements. Didn't have cell phones back then. Didn't have satellite phones. They can just call up and get reinforcements. What would they do? They take this guy and they say, hey, go run 50 miles or whatever it is and go tell that that uh, land over there that we'll tell this other king that we need reinforcements. And then he'd run back. Uh, I always forget the guy's name, but there's the the it's kind of a legend. I don't think it, I don't know if it's true or not, but the Greek uh, guy that started the, the, the where they got the idea of the marathon, 26.2 miles. Fidepol I can't ever remember his name. Anybody remember? Top of your head? Fidepolis or something like that. I always mess it up. Okay, but the story is, you know, he didn't run, just run 26.2 miles. He ran and uh, went to another town. I don't remember how far it is, Spar uh, to Sparta, I guess it was. And he got reinforcements and then he came back, right? Fought in the war and then they won. And so then he ran back and he said, we won. And then the legend says that he fell over dead. <laughs> okay, but he had put like something like 200 miles on his feet in one day, plus probably fought in the war or whatever. Okay. But the idea was these messengers was they, their job was to run and deliver the message. Okay. And that would be terrible, especially if you're delivering bad news. Right. But the guy that brought the good news, Hey man, that was, his feet were precious because they were bringing something, uh, very good. And so, uh, let's look at Romans chapter 10. You probably already knew this is where I was going the whole time, but Romans chapter 10, let's start in verse eight. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart, which is the word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is neither... Uh, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pause there just for a minute. Now, you've heard this come up a lot in my preaching lately. And if you follow me on Facebook at all, you've seen me hitting on this a lot. And people are probably thinking, why is he just so hung up on the Lordship salvation? Why is he talking about this and talking about that? And all I can say is like in the last year or so, I just feel like Satan just keeps on sending these attacks, you know, about the soul winning efforts here and, and how, you know, uh, we're just you know, just leading people to make false professions and all that kind of stuff. And, and they're trying to show like there's more than that. And look, I understand there's more than that. My own son got saved after 15 years, not 15 years, but however, 10 years or whatever it was of, uh, of, you know, saying he was saved, right? He understood what to say, to say the right words, but by his own testimony, it wasn't in his heart. So I understand that people make professions, they confess something with their mouth that they didn't actually believe in their heart. I understand it's believing, 
right? It's believing the gospel. But every single time, it's like as many times somebody attacks or they send something and they challenge that or they say, hey, you need to stop, you know, hanging out with this group of people. You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that because, you know, you're not preaching repentance and you're sending all these people to hell. And I'm turning it around saying, I mean, I think you're more likely sending people to hell by what you're teaching in this Lordship Salvation. And I just keep battling this, it seems like. But every time I open up my Bible and I just start reading, it's like the Holy Spirit says, look how simple it is. You go preach. If they believe that gospel that you're preaching and they receive that and they call on the Lord, they're saved. And you don't have to worry about, well, did I do it right? Did I say it right? Do I need to wash their fruit and see if they change their life and I do all that? Look, that is not our job. And the funny thing is the people that preach that, they say, oh, it's not our job. We can't get anybody saved. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, well, then why do you have to say anything about you need to turn your life and you need to let the Holy Spirit change you and you need to repent and all that kind of stuff. Amen. If it's the work of the Spirit, he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> but I tell you why, because Satan wants to stop the efforts of soul winners. And so anything he can do to stop that. And so you got Christians who are saved. I think a lot of them are saved. And they're saying, no, I just don't think this works. And no, you can't do that. Oh, you're making false professions. And I'm telling you, it's, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not I, well, you didn't hear me say, if I see this in the Bible, I still wouldn't do it or something like that. No, no. If you could show me in the Bible, I would change my mind. But I'm telling you, I'm certain as can be. The Holy Spirit has showed me our job is to preach the gospel. And that's it. Sow the seed. That's it. All right. And uh, and here's what it says. For there is no uh, verse th 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And uh, uh, and how shall they believe in him who they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is as it is, it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And then it goes on in verse 16 to say, but they have not all obeyed. And if you go down to Isaiah 53, that's where he gets this quote from. All right, but we won't have time, time to go there. But I just want to say this. <clears throat> Why are the feet important? Why is it so important that people are sent? Right? How can they preach unless they're sent? Because the gospel, taking the gospel and preaching the gospel is something that Jesus told his church to do. And he said, go ye, <laughs> go, you need to take the gospel out here. Here's what now I praise the Lord. If somebody just pops in the church to hear the gospel message, uh, I don't preach the gospel message a whole lot from the pulpit because most people, I think everybody in here is saved, but it's going to come up just as you're reading the Bible and all that. So say somebody comes in here, they get saved, praise the Lord. But you know, a lot of churches, their mentality is, ah, soul winning doesn't work. You can't go door to door. What they need to do is they need to come to the church and they need to hear the preaching and then the Holy Spirit needs to work on their life and then they need to come forward to the altar and then they need to get saved, right? Which I always thought was so funny because if they come to the altar you know, they get saved in like five minutes. And if we go knock on their door, right, we'll talk to them for like sometimes 30 minutes before they call on the Lord, right? And these people will say, no, 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 they're not really getting saved at the door. Yet they can get saved in five minutes at the altar. Oh, praise the Lord, mark it down. <laughs> right? And they'll, what they'll say is, oh yeah, but see, but they were under conviction. That's why they came to the altar. You can generate conviction with the soft playing of the piano and the preacher gets up and he snaps his fingers. Hey, somebody, somebody here, the Holy Spirit's convicting you. And the preacher is doing the one generating the conviction. You see what I mean? Uh, so, so don't give me that. <laughs> somebody came for it. I could just as easily say those people came for the altar. They didn't get saved. You just coerced them to come to the altar. But I don't say that. If they confess Christ, praise the Lord. I'm going to say they're saved. And so we go, but Jesus sent us. He said, he said, how beautiful are the feet of them that are sent, right? The, 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 the go and preach glad, glad tidings. Uh, Romans chapter 10 says, you know, how can they, how will they preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet? Well, what's so important about the feet? Why does he keep stressing the feet? Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod. That word shod is just means you put the shoes on. All right. It's like shoed, <laughs> like you shoe a horse or right? your feet shod. And what are there? What are your feet shod with? The preparation of the gospel of peace. Right. We could just stop right there. Really, you get the, the point. But as it's talking about all these pieces of armor and protection or whatever, it says, oh, by the way, put your shoes on. Your shoes are, you know, symbolically with the preparation of the gospel of, pre, uh, of peace. Why your feet? Why are they on your feet? Because giving the gospel involves us going into the world and preaching the gospel, which is exactly what Jesus told us to do. Somebody on Facebook just recently said, uh, uh, said actually he said the the bible actually never says go preach the gospel somebody said what are you talking about and so he quoted from in mark where it says go into all the world and preach the gospel and he said well there's a discrepancy some people don't even believe that that was in the originals and so if you look at all the modern translations they don't even have that in there and i'm just like how it can't be more clear in the bible that we are to go into the world and we are to preach the gospel to every creature all right and if you do that Guess what? You got beautiful feet. You don't have to worry about pedicures. You don't have to worry about getting foot massages and oil. Now, look, if somebody's going to do that, go ahead, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, uh, but anyway, you want beautiful feet? Go and preach Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the work that you've called us to do. And thank you for the souls that call on you. Um, help us never be discouraged by the fact that there are people who don't really uh, put their trust in you. Uh, but that's not our job, Lord. Help us to go out and preach. Help us to be consistent and to stay inspired and to encourage one another and just to be excited about the job you call us to do. Help us not be weary or to be distracted by the things of this world, Lord, but help us make the time to go out and complete this mission you've called us to do. Help us knock every door, particularly here. I'm thinking about just the doors in Kansas City and the Kansas City area. I pray, Lord, you help us to uh, finish that, that huge job and that we'll take the gospel to every door to those who will listen. And, uh, and I pray that you'll help us be wise and be bold and have discernment, but help us not be dis distracted uh, or stopped by the wiles of the devil. And I pray that you will be blessed by what we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.